Okay, guys, let's go ahead and get this thing started. Um, welcome to another agent training. Um, we have um, Liz and Matt from Pillar to Post with us this morning, and they are going to be teaching us about uh, 1920s houses. So um, a couple housekeeping things. Remember that we have training uh, the rest of this week, too, on Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, tomorrow is an agent panel um, featuring, oh God, I'm going to forget everyone. Let me, uh, let me look. Featuring Crystal White, Zach Canada, Amy Jones, and Josh Newman. And uh, we're talking about work-life balance. So hope you can join us for that. Um, without further ado, over to Liz and Matt. Thanks for joining us. Guys. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, just a heads up that I have a plumber here in my house. So now our furnace died last week and our water heater died yesterday. And this is the reality of living in an old house. So um, Matt is actually going to be doing the presenting this morning, but where Matt has been doing home inspections since 2005. We do a bunch of free CE classes throughout the year because Matt and I are very, um, very passionate about agent education. We really believe that smarter agents or better agents, better resources for their clients. And then you actually help make the inspection process a lot easier for the clients because you can help lead them um, through the whole home buying process. But one of the things that we're kind of known for is how Matt evaluates older homes. Matt is a chemical engineer by trade, by education. Um, and then came into this industry because of a poor home inspection experience when he was building his house. Um, so there's a lot of left-brained information that you're going to get about 1920s homes. We're going to talk about the socioeconomic um, times of the 1920s that impacted building. Um, so if you love history and you're a bit of a nerd, then this is the class for you. And then finally, at the end of it, we're going to talk about what that means for buyers of older homes and what they should realistically expect throughout the um, home buying process with a 1920s home. The one thing that we find of extreme value is if you have questions, just don't wait till the end, jump in, unmute yourself, and Matt can answer them. And I think um, this is this is what we have until nine, 12, 1030, 10.30, correct, Rosie? Okay, so Matt has a naturally gravelly voice. It is not because of allergies, so COVID. just to, yeah, it's not from COVID, so uh, just wanted to get that out of the way because some people are very concerned about his vocal cords. There we go, Matt. I will turn it over to you. Uh, so we are talking about 1920s houses today, correct? I hope, because that's the presentation I have pulled up, so I guess we're talking about it regardless. Um, this presentation actually grew out of a realization we had starting with kind of the real estate boomlet that we've been in for the last two or three years that a lot of our agents didn't know in depth uh, a lot about the houses or the product that they were selling and their buyers, especially their younger cohort of buyers and especially even their first time buyers, the people who are probably most inclined to buy an older house didn't know anything about the houses they were buying. So we put this presentation together in an effort to kind of educate everybody to what you should actually expect when you're buying an older, in this case, 1920s house. Um, and then we've also got them coming for 1940s houses and things like that. So that is where this presentation grew out of. <coughs> As Liz said, um, it kind of delves into the history of why 1920s houses are built the way they are and how they're built the way they are. So, um, We've got about 132 slides to get through. We've got about 90 minutes to do it. So I better start talking about 1920s houses and quit rambling. Um, my window is open sitting upstairs here because uh, it is a beautiful day outside again. So if you hear fire trucks or cars go by, I apologize, but I don't want to be trapped completely inside on a day like this. So let me pull up share screen, the presentation. We will share that out. I will turn my camera off so you guys don't have to look at me while I'm talking. Shrink that panel down and 
Liz, can we see that? It's up? Yes, Matt. Awesome. One of the disadvantages of presenting remotely like this is I can't see what everybody else sees. I can only see what's on my computer screen. So I have to ask Liz if she can see the feed going out and make sure everything is working the way it's supposed to. Uh, also keep in mind, this presentation was actually <laughs> designed for a live studio audience. Um, so there's stuff in here where we normally pause and stop and ask questions. We're probably going to kind of gloss over that today um, so we don't waste too much time. So without too much further ado, the 1920s house. Um, we want to educate you guys on the history and socioeconomic climate of the 1920s that impacted housing construction methods of that time. We want to do that to be able to help you properly educate clients about the kind of unique attributes of a 1920s house um, and to effectively communicate that information um, in regards to how it might impact modern day issues on 1920s houses and how, really how that affects today's buyer. So some of the major events of the 1920s that drive this socioeconomic change we're gonna be talking about. World War I had just ended in 1918. Women had just run the right to vote. And most importantly for us in this industry, the American census for the first time revealed that as a country, we were becoming more urban than rural. So more people were now living in cities and towns than were living in the country. And that was the first time in our history that had actually happened. Um, so in the 1920s, we were in a time of prosperity after World War I. Companies like Ford exceeded $1 billion in income and <laughs> we're doing things like announcing a 40 hour work week so people had more leisure time. And the 1920s were the very beginning of the golden age of Hollywood. And across the bottom of here is a whole bunch of Hollywood stars of the 1920s. This is our way to ask people if they recognize them. As many times as I've given this presentation, I can only get most of them. Um, I wanna say Buster Crab, obviously Charlie Chaplin, Rita Garbo, Rita Hayworth, oh, John Barrymore and Rudolph Valentino, I think. I don't have my notes in front of me. Some of the major inventions of 1920 are things that we still use today. Residential air conditioning uh, first came out in the 1920s. Things like hair dryers, appliances, washing machines, dishwashers, refrigerators, vacuum cleaners, cars obviously, stoplights shortly after cars, and even things like bubble gum are all inventions of the 1920s. <clears throat> the electric razor, radio, uh, Pez, Band-Aids, and again, another picture of a vacuum cleaner. So the 1920s really is when the world began to look like what we think it looks like today. So it's kind of considered the first modern era or the first modern decade, even though now it's almost 100 years ago. Why is it called the Roaring Twenties? Um, and this is not usually something you will learn in school there was actually a depression um, beginning in 1920 and ending in 1921 that nobody knows about that was actually steeper and deeper and more wide ranging than the Great Depression of 1920, than the 1929 crash. Um, our response to those two different depressions was entirely different. So in 1920, what we did was cut taxes and government spending by 50% and then 50% again to stimulate the economy. And as a result of that, our national debt actually fell by more than one third. And what could have been a very long lasting depression was very short, about a year to about a year and a half. Um, and that is what resulted in the unprecedented economic growth of the 1920s. It was that loosening of regulation and that lowering of taxes that gave people a ton of money to spend. And that is why we ended up in the 1920s. It's, it's a fascinating case study um, if you ever want to read about it. But that depression of 1920 and 1921 was actually much worse statistically and numerically speaking than the crash in 1929. But as a result of that, the 1920s are a period of very vigorous, very vital economic growth. It is again considered the first truly modern decade with a lot of dramatic economic developments found in that 10 year period of the 1920s. <coughs> of importance to us, 
we had a national a nationwide real estate bubble that began around 1921 and didn't really deflate until around 1926. Uh, in some ways, it's a little bit similar to what we've been going through for the last two, three, four years here, kind of what felt like a never ending boom in the real estate world. It will eventually deflate, um, but it took five or six years in the 1920s for that to happen. And that's why we have, in large part, so many 1920s in cities like Indianapolis. Um, that economic prosperity began in large part because of the rapid adoption of the automobile to the detriment of passenger rail travel. But if you look back at all the automobile manufacturers of the 1920s, there were literally hundreds of them. Some very well known, a few of which are still around, many of which are gone but companies like Stutz, Auburn, Studebaker, Stanley, were all manufacturing automobiles in the 1920s. Chevy is obviously still around. Chrysler is obviously still around. Um, even Sunbeam, most people associate with small handheld appliances, was manufacturing cars in the 1920s. So that huge boom in automotive travel is one of the great stimuluses of the economy in the 1920s. And it also made possible that move to the city from the country because now you could travel back and forth relatively easily where you couldn't do that before. This is when we first became very mobile as a society or where we began to become mobile as a society. And as a result of that, the growth of the suburbs really began to escalate. So you could live in the city but work or live in the suburbs, I'm sorry, but work in the city and drive or commute back and forth for the first time in American history. Um, it also caused a rapid expansion of electric utility networks, which led to more consumer appliances uh, in homes. We have all kinds of new types of lighting and heating, which we'll be talking about a little bit more. But all of that is the result of this kind of sudden economic expansion driven in large part by the automobile industry happening in the 1920s. We also had radio really begin to take hold. That began to break up rural isolation uh, because people could now get information on a relatively quick, almost instantaneous basis. We expanded our local and long distance telephone networks in the 1920s, so communications was rapidly expanding. And for the first time, because of those 40 hour work weeks and the lessening of the labor load, um, we had more time for recreational activities. So things like traveling, movies, and professional sports all started to become major businesses in the 1920s because people had more leisure time. Um, my wife loves to camp, so on the bottom of this slide are pictures of uh, literally various RVs of the 1920s, some of which look like the precursors to RVs that we have today, some of them literally houses on wheels, which don't seem particularly safe uh, to be driving down the road. But the RV industry actually began in the 1920s as well. Um, when we put this together, I wanted to look back and see what a 1920s mortgage looked like because I had this sneaking suspicion it was radically different than uh, what we have today as a mortgage. And a typical 1920s mortgage is radically different than what we think of as a mortgage today. Your average home cost was about $6,000. Uh, the mortgage generally had a variable interest rate and a very short maturity of five years or so. So no 30 year mortgages back then. Um, you had a high down payment of about 50% typically for a mortgage. And the mortgage itself was actually typically interest only with a large balloon payment due at the maturity of that loan. So usually at that five year mark. Uh, you did have the ability to renegotiate the mortgage every year, depending on what interest rates were doing at that point in time. So when you look at all of this, the barrier to home ownership was relatively high but it very much incentivized thrift and savings. Um, and as a result of that, the mortgage default rate in the 1920s was low to non-existent. You know, and it's no wonder when you've got a five-year loan and you've got to put 50% down that that's the case. Um, but banking back then was much, much more, I don't want to say regulated, um, but stricter in what they would uh, accept for loans on mortgages. So home ownership was not as high a level as it is right now. There was actually a lot more renting going on, but when people did buy a house, they usually owned it outright in a very short period of time. 
So really interesting to look back at mortgage and banking principles at that point in time as well. Uh, some of the construction materials and building methods, uh, the 1920s were very much a part of a transition between 19th century style housing and what we think of the modern housing as today. But we were developing a lot of new materials and building methods. So it meant that houses were easier to heat and cool. They were far more hygienic than what they used to be. And for the first time, they became more suited to what we would consider a modern living style. So we're gonna go through and touch on a few of those systems, kind of look at what they looked like in the 1920s versus what they looked like today. So this is where we start to get into some really good information for us to be able to pass along to our clients and what they might be able to expect actually physically in a 1920s house. Um, Liz, I need you to keep me on track here because I can it's only not only see this presenter view, so I can't tell how I'm doing on time. You're doing fine. Okay, great. So heating and cooling equipment in a 1920s house. The 1920s were a time of great growth and great change in the heating industry. And we began to expand into various forms of energy, gas and oil specifically, um, that we now use for heating equipment that had to spell the develop or spur the development of new components in the heating industry, quite a few of which are actually a fundamental part of how we heat and cool houses today. Historically speaking, the same equipment was used for both providing warmth in the house and for cooking. So think basically cast iron stove sitting in the parlor or in the kitchen, both used to heat the house and to do your cooking on. In fact, homeowners handbooks as late as the mid 1920s would often refer to the furnace for the house actually as a stove because there was that crossover. That stove was used to both heat and cool until roughly the turn of the century or so. By the 1920s, houses generally had one appliance for heating and another for cooking. So that's when we begin to see the separation take place. So a kitchen stove of the 1920s was more likely to be fueled by either gas or electricity than it was anymore by coal or wood, especially in the cities. You know, obviously in the country, out in the uh, more rural areas of the country, <clears throat> having coal-fired or wood-fired stoves kept up for quite a while. But in the cities, now in the 1920s, your cooking appliances were much more likely to be fueled by either gas or electricity. Coal was still the primary fuel of choice for furnaces, although in the 1920s is when we start to see that change, which we'll talk about here in a second. So cooking appliances, for the first time, actually began to look kind of like what we would expect a stove or a range to look like now. And they ranged from a gas stove here on the left, kind of the same model here on the right, to fully electric stoves, which we had actually in the 1920s, that use kind of the same heating coils that a less expensive electric stove will use today. And if you were to pop this oven open, you'd see the same electric heating coil in the bottom of that oven. So appliances first started to look like what we would expect them to look like today. It's funny, we, um, the house I grew up in, my parents had an old, I don't wanna say cast iron, but a lot of it was cast iron gas stove that looked almost identical to this one that we saw on the left that they must have picked up at a garage sale or something that clearly dated back to the 1920s that we would use a couple of times a year at Thanksgiving and Christmas, but that still worked absolutely fine, even though that would have been the 1970s and the 1980s. So again, when they say they don't build them like they used to, in a lot of instances, that is absolutely true. And that holds very true of 1920s appliances. So long lifespan on those appliances, they begin to look like what we expect them to look like now. Our predominant method of heating in the 1920s was still with coal. Uh, you'll often hear a furnace of that, referred, of that time referred to as the monster in the basement. Um, if you think back to a Christmas story when um, Ralphie's dad has to constantly go out and fight with the furnace because he's getting clinkers in it and the smoke comes billowing up out of the stairs, that would have been a coal-fired furnace probably from about the 1920s or so. Uh, heating with coal is backbreaking work. Uh, the earliest iterations of these furnaces, you actually had to stoke by hand. So you would literally have to go down and shovel coal into the furnace to keep it going. 
Coal is dirty to heat with uh, from a physical point of view. There's a lot of coal dust, there's a lot of ash that would get all over your house. But despite all of these problems, coal was definitely the king in the heating world of the 1920s because it was relatively inexpensive, very readily available across the country, and therefore that it was the predominant method of heating houses in the 1920s. If you have never seen a coal-fired furnace, the one on the left here is actually a relatively small one. They're usually considerably bigger than that. The one on the right is um, essentially how they would deliver coal to your house. If you were lucky and you lived in the city, they were able to actually dump it right next to the coal chute leading into the house. If you were really lucky, you might get a truck with a chute that would attach to the coal chute in your house and they could literally dump it into the basement. But oftentimes the dump truck would pull up in front of the house and you would carry that coal bucket by bucket to the coal chute, dump it down the coal chute and into the basement of your house. My grandmother's house had a coal chute built into it. So my uncle still remember doing this as kids. Um, and we still inspect a lot of houses today that have an old abandoned coal chute in them or a coal bunker in the basement. So heating with coal was definitely the way houses were warmed in the 1920s. Uh, we did see a lot of innovation even with coal furnaces in the 1920s, things like the automatic stoker, uh, which was basically just a large screw device where you would fill a hopper with coal and it would slowly feed it into the furnace, basically appeared in industrial applications early in the century, not introduced to houses until the mid 1920s. It looks something like this and it basically sits next to the furnace. You fill that hopper up with coal and it feeds it slowly into the furnace. If it was really fancy, it would actually have a thermostat attached to it that would regulate the speed of that stoker and then actually regulate the temperature in the house itself. Um, believe it or not, we still find these in basements every once in a blue moon. I have not seen an operable one for the better part of a decade now, but they are still out there because they were big and heavy and bulky and people, when they were abandoned, just left them sitting in basements. So you still will find both automatic stokers, occasionally an abandoned coal-fired furnace, and we will still oftentimes still find lumps of coal in crawl spaces and old abandoned coal bunkers and furnaces. So that is common as well. So the remnants of all this stuff is definitely still out there in the real world. Coal was not our only fuel choice in the 1920s, uh, and especially because of World War I meant that we did occasionally have coal shortages. Um, battleships and a lot of military equipment of that time actually ran on coal. So when we finally entered into the war in 1917, um, coal was uh, diverted in a lot of instances for military use. So that is when we began to see heating equipment converted over to other types of fuel. There was no shortage of oil in the 1920s and people began to explore the benefits of using oil for heating at that point in time. It did require some new furnace design, but it eventually resulted in much more efficient furnaces with both oil and gas burners that had a much smaller footprint than a coal-fired furnace. So there is an abundance of oil-fired furnaces that came out in the 1920s that we will still every once in a great while find a 1920s oil-fired furnace, believe it or not, that is still in operation. Companies like Honeywell first made their appearance um, in the early 1900s and began to become prominent in the 1920s because they began manufacturing control equipment for oil and gas-fired furnaces and for some coal-fired furnaces actually at that point in time. So a, a lot of what we think of as the modern thermostat made its debut in the 1920s. So that oil heating spread throughout the 1920s because people discovered it was a more efficient fuel source. It was more easily transportable. Your BTUs out of oil were higher than they were with coal. So by the late 1920s, roughly 400,000 to half a million houses in the U.S. were heated with oil, and it really began to take off after that. It was not nearly as messy as coal. It didn't need it to be stoked. It could actually be pumped. Um, so we see oil beginning to take hold and then really taking off in the 1920s. And you'll see really interesting furnace designs in the 1920s, especially as that oil began to take over as a fuel. Um, this is a picture of um, not actually still in operation anymore, but made by Lennox, who is still in business. 
It's a combination of oil-fired warm air furnace and actually water heater all in the same appliance. So we always think of those as being completely separate devices these days, but there was a ton of innovation in that HVAC industry in the 1920s, and they were doing very forward thinking things like combining actually their oil-fired furnace and their water heater all into one appliance. So if you look at this, again, made by Lennox, but it's got both ducting for warm air for heating the house and then piping for a little subsection of this that was actually the water heater for the house. So not nearly as backwards as a lot of people think when you start to look at heating and cooling design of that era. And in fact, we use a lot of those same principles today. We began to see natural gas or gas heating show up in the 1920s, um, especially in more urban areas as we develop that infrastructure we could pipe that gas actually to somebody's house. So it didn't have to be delivered like oil or coal. It has a higher heat value than most other kinds of gas or other fuels. So it was, if we could get it to the house, a very attractive fuel for heating in the 1920s. <clears throat> the problem was we really only had that infrastructure available in urban areas. So by the mid 1920s, about a quarter million US homeowners had switched to heating with natural gas. Um, this is natural gas. So this is basically methane that we're pumping out of the ground. And there were other forms actually of gas heating on top of that in the 1920s. So when we think of gas heating these days, we think almost exclusively of natural gas or propane of actually petroleum products that we pump out of the ground. But there were roughly 4 million other customers heating with what was called manufactured gas or town gas, which was actually gas made from coal, petroleum, waste animal fats and oils, or even gasoline um, that was manufactured by cracking those compounds and converting them from a liquid fuel into a gaseous fuel. So that at one point in time was even more popular than the natural gas. In the 1920s, this is hard to believe these days um, with as much emphasis as we place on petroleum fuels, but natural gas was considered a waste product when drilling for oil um, or when pumping oil out of the ground. If there was a natural gas pocket, they basically just vented it to the atmosphere and let it bleed away and got rid of it, or they burned it off. It was considered undesirable and it had not been really adapted for a fuel yet and even gasoline to a large extent <coughs> was considered so cheap and easy to make out of petroleum products that they actually converted a lot of it to town gas for heating purposes. So by the end of the 1920s, you had about 12 million residential, commercial, and industrial consumers actually using manufactured gas. So gas that we would make from petroleum out of the ground rather than using the natural gas that was occurring there, well, naturally, I guess. So natural gas considered a waste product in the 1920s. We did not do a lot of heating with electricity in the 1920s, but by the late 1920s, about two thirds of our houses actually had electricity. Again, especially concentrated in urban areas with some rural outliers that had not been electrified yet. Um, my grandparents um, in North Judson, Indiana, still knew people when they were growing up and when they were adults way out in the country uh, who did not have electricity well into the 30s and even into the 1940s because rural electrification had not been completed yet here in Indiana. But by the 1920s, about two thirds of our houses had electricity and the only ones who didn't were pretty far out in the country in rural areas. Uh, so companies like GE offered numerous products for electric cooking, as well as some localized space heating equipment. So electric stoves, again, a lot of people don't realize it, but were very much a 1920s thing. And even electric space heaters, which is what that picture is on the right, uh, were really showing up in the 1920s. In a lot of cases, they were nothing more than a very large, very inefficient light bulb, which is what this picture shows, but they used electricity for space heating then as well. It wasn't really used a lot to heat entire houses, but it was used to run HVAC equipment like thermostats, and then a little bit later on blowers and pumps and things of that nature. Um, so that accessibility to electricity 
is what kind of sets the stage and that accessibility makes it, it ripe as a competing energy source for the following decades. When we get into the 1950s and 60s is when we'll finally start to see houses heated with electricity, but it hadn't really taken off um, as a home heating method yet in the 1920s. It did drive a lot of innovation in the 1920s. So things like what they would have called the aerofan or the main blower for a forced air furnace first began to make their, 20, their appearance in the 1920s. So things like that made the modern forced air furnace feasible and for the first time began to offer us an alternative to a room radiator, either a hot water <clears throat> or a steam radiator to heat a room. So this is when we first begin to see forced air as a heating method. It allowed us that use of electricity or that availability of electricity allowed us to develop things like thermostats, which makes the development of the automatic central heating system possible. So by the mid 1920s, we're actually using thermostats to control heating. And again, we begin to see what we would consider the first modern heating and cooling systems installed in houses. So the picture on the right here is actually an early thermostat which strangely, when you look at just the thermostat part of it and ignore the clock part of it, which they all seem to have for some reason in the 1920s, is very, very similar to what we would expect a thermostat to look like today. So the modern thermostat is one of those things that begins to make its appearance in the 1920s. And you will still occasionally see these hanging on the walls of older houses, although we again almost never see them in use anymore. Liz, how are we doing on time? You're doing fine, Matt. See, I really say that so I can stop and take a drink of coffee so my voice doesn't completely give out on me. Oh, then I'll say it slower. You're doing fine, Matt. Thank you, Liz. Okay, cooling, at least central air conditioning and central cooling first began to debut in the 1920s. We would usually stop here and say who invented the first air conditioner, which living in Indianapolis, you guys should all know was Willis Carrier. Um, he is the one who is credited for basically inventing modern air conditioning. And the really truly the first machine resembling a modern AC unit was invented by Carrier. He worked mainly in the industrial world um, and he was trying to develop a machine that attempted to prevent paper from wrinkling in the heat and humidity of a Brooklyn publishing company. So in the middle of New York City. So like so many things that we see in our houses, Air conditioning was invented first for an industrial application and then later modified for use in a residential application. Um, so a lot of times people were trying to solve manufacturing problems and eventually that technology gets moved into residential um, applications. So the first attempts at modern air conditioning basically used ice of all things and resembled nothing more really than a gigantic ice cream freezer. Um, it's essentially a block of ice connected to a fan. You put 200 pounds of ice in the machine, the fan would blow over the top of it, and you would circulate that cool air throughout your house. Uh, it's what a lot of us would kind of refer to as a swamp cooler these days, but the first air conditioning units really and truly were nothing more than giant fans with a block of ice. Um, and then again, you move that cool air through the house and you call it air conditioning. There are some obvious problems with this in that you have a lot of water to drain away and you have to have a source of ice in the middle of the summertime, which is not an easy thing to come by. But keep in mind, even into the 1910s, early 1920s, we used ice for literally ice boxes, which we've all seen pictures of. We used it in very wealthy people's houses and very fancy applications um, for cooling actually inside houses. Uh, Alexander Graham Bell made a big deal out of a, what they called air conditioning, but was really just a, a kind of an ice machine. Uh, he would air condition his basement and then spend his summer down there. Um, and you can even find instances of them trying to do this to, oh, my wife is going to correct me on this, but I think it was when Garfield was shot. They would do the same thing um, to try and ease some of his symptoms because he lingered for quite a while after he was shot. Um, but that was the first attempt at air conditioning. Sorry, I'm rambling a little bit on this because I find the evolution of it very interesting. They were relatively effective. They were relatively expensive because as your ice melts during the summer in your ice houses, the price of it goes up. Um, they required tremendous, out, tremendous amounts of that very expensive ice to be useful. So most people did not have them in, your house, in their houses. 
Um, in an attempt to continue the development of that, Carrier eventually figured out what we now call the refrigeration cycle, which is compressing a refrigerant and letting it expand, and then it cools as it expands. And as a result of that, we were able to develop the first truly modern, or what we would consider a modern air conditioning unit using actually refrigerant that didn't require ice, and really all you had to do was plug it in and let it run. Original versions of this actually used ammonia as a refrigerant, um, which is a very small molecule and very toxic. So they had a tendency to leak and occasionally kill people. So not a great refrigerant, but shortly thereafter that we developed more modern refrigerants, some of which are still in use today. Heck, a lot of industrial applications <clears throat> still use ammonia as a refrigerant because it's actually very efficient in that refrigeration cycle. But because of its toxicity and propensity to leak, you don't want it in a residential air conditioning system. But first air conditioning systems began to be developed and implemented residentially in the 1920s, although we don't really see them take off until later because they were expensive. But by the late 1920s, by 1929, Frigidaire had created what they called a room cooler, which was really the ancestor of the modern window or uh, in-room air conditioner that we see today. And in fact, it's in a cabinet and really doesn't look <coughs> all that different than the little small air conditioners you can buy on Amazon now for local or for spot cooling. So air conditioning first began to be implemented in the 1920s. Uh, prior to that, some of the things people did to stay cool are kind of interesting. Uh, if you think summers are hot and miserable now, think back 100 years ago or 125 years ago. Um, to keep cool, you would literally sleep it off during the middle of the day. You had to do things like carry handheld fans, um, go for a swim in the middle of the day because that was the only way to cool off. A little bit later uh, in the 1930s and throughout the Great Depression, air conditioning began to become available in public buildings on a larger scale basis. Um, a lot of places still couldn't afford to put them in, but the one venue that's almost, that was almost always air conditioned, especially in the city, actually was movie theaters. Um, and they advertised that air conditioning actually as an attraction in and of itself. And people could come into a movie theater, see a couple of films, and get cool during the heat of the summertime. So the AC becomes pretty much an attraction in and of itself throughout the 1920s and 30s as we begin to cool commercial buildings. And that's one of the reasons we see Hollywood's golden age begin at this same time is because of people flocking to movie theaters when it's hot outside. Uh, other things we will see in 1920s houses to this day, housing design, because we did not air condition houses back then and because proportionally it was more expensive to heat a house then than it is now and houses were less efficient, we took design into uh, account when we would actually lay out our houses. So a lot of homes in the 1920s, do they take advantage of passive solar design principles, even though they didn't call them that. So they would build their houses in such a way that they would have a cross draft or a cross breeze. So it would be siting them on a lot so that the predominant winds would literally blow through the house to help it keep cool. You'll see things like wraparounder sleeping porches on 1920s houses lots of big overhangs to shade the windows in the summertime. And even things like awnings were popular in the 1920s to keep houses from getting heated up by that solar gain when the sun is high in the sky and it's hot outside. So 1920s houses, interestingly, are actually more often um, better designed to reduce the energy load on the house from the environment, at least from the sun. Uh, insulation hadn't really become a thing yet, but trying to keep a house cool in the summertime in the Midwest caused them to put more thought into their home design than what we do now, because now we can just design a big box knowing that it's going to be air conditioned and we really don't have to worry as much about that heat gain in the summertime. Uh, and in the upper classes in the 1920s, the fashion then was to basically completely ignore the heat. And the idea is that you were just immune to temperatures. Um, you didn't acknowledge that it was hot. You didn't acknowledge that it was cold in the wintertime, um, which is why you would have people passing out on the street because they were wearing coat and tie or uh, a long dress and a corset and doing their best to not acknowledge that it was hot outside. So people looked at weather a little bit differently in the 1920s than what we do now as well.
But the takeaway from this part of the presentation is that really the first modern air conditioning systems were beginning to be developed in the 1920s and are, at least in their roots, very similar to what we see now. All right, plumbing of the 1920s, again, like so much else in this presentation, really begins to resemble a modern plumbing system. So by 1920, the majority of new construction included indoor plumbing and at least one full bathroom. And again, this is especially true of the cities, um, but not necessarily in the country as of yet. The water closet, so the toilet, actually was finally completing a transformation that had begun in the late 1880s um, and it basically centered on now what we would consider a modern toilet or one with a siphon principle that facilitates the flushing of waste away into a municipal wastewater system. So in appearance and function, the bathroom of the late 1920s was very similar to what we would expect to see today. And actually when people picture kind of a classic bathroom, what they often picture in their heads is a 1920s bathroom with the tile and the pedestal sinks um, and the fancier plumbing fixtures because it was kind of a, I don't know if you want to call it a golden era of bathroom design, but for the first time, a lot of people actually had indoor plumbing and they could remember a time when they didn't, when they had to go use the outhouse in the middle of the winter or the middle of summer. So again, by the early 1920s, at least most urban houses have one modern bathroom in them. And again, by the 1920s, what little bit of code we actually did have began to require indoor bathrooms and all new single family residential construction, more for hygiene than for anything else. Because the modern world, as, we, as our population was really growing and booming, we needed to be able to get rid of that human waste so that modern toilet wasn't so much for convenience inside the house. It wasn't because people got tired of walking to the outhouse, but it was for hygiene um, to prevent disease in urban settings. So this is where you'll begin to see all new construction having to have at least one bathroom. Um, and again, this is kind of a weird little bit of history, but if you go back and you look at toilet design, Radical change in the 1920s from what we considered originally a water closet or a high tank toilet where you literally had to use a bunch of gravity to help it flush to what we would now consider a more modern toilet design. Although they look a little bit different these days, the principle of a 1920s toilet is exactly the same as what it is now. So even in the 1920s, Kohler um, was producing basically what we would consider a modern toilet. Again, it looks a little bit different, but it's a low tank, it's a siphon down at the bottom, and it's exactly how a toilet works today. And interestingly enough, we will still find these in the basement of houses as well. Oftentimes not in use, but every once in a while, you'll still find one that keeps going and going and going. This entire thing, made out of cast iron, so heavy as all get out to try and lift it and move it, pretty durable material. So that's why we do occasionally still see them in use out there. Um, plumbing had a direct impact on the electrical industry and vice versa is also true. Um, between 1921 and 1928, electrical companies gained roughly 10 million new customers. And that is because for the first time, instead of having a hand pump to pump water out of your well, you could now put in an electric water pump to supply sinks in the kitchen and bathroom and finally get rid of actually having to hand pump all of that water. So electricity spurred growth in the plumbing industry and the two kind of go hand in hand where they both grew together. So again, this is really the modernization of both the electrical and the plumbing industries because believe it or not, those two actually overlap because of those pump systems that people could finally install. Um, so by the end of the 1920s, most urban areas in Indiana had electricity. Um, a lot of rural areas still did not, but because those urban areas all basically had electricity, we could now have running water in pretty much all of our houses in the cities and a fair distance out into the country as well. So all of that goes hand in hand. So we've got electricity, now we can have plumbing. Um, and again, it's what we would consider kind of the modern era for both of those systems. Plumbing material of the 1920s, we used lead primarily for water mains. So bringing water to houses, 
and the drain side of the system. We still find it sometimes in distribution piping. We will talk about that a little bit later when we talk about client expectations. Most distribution piping by the 1920 was galvanized steel. Most drain piping was cast iron by that point in time. Um, and most external drains leading from the house to the city main were either clay or cast iron. And again, we'll talk a little bit about some of the problems with those later on. If you guys are dealing with old houses, I'm sure you're already aware of what some of the issues of those are. Um, a lot of your clients are gonna worry about lead in a plumbing system. Lead has been around for ages, initially used by Romans in their water delivery system. In fact, the word plumbing is designed for the Latin, or is derived from the Latin word for lead, which is plumbum or plumbum. Um, it was durable, versatile, and affordable, which is what made it a popular material for use in houses. Obviously, there are some health problems with it. By the 1920s, we be, were really beginning to understand that there were health issues using lead in our plumbing systems. And a lot of it was actually being removed from plumbing systems by the 1920s, but it had been used in a, a lot up until that point in time. <coughs> um, and again, we'll talk some more about the health problems and health effects of it later on. But efforts to ban lead were underway at that point in time. And like so many things in our world, we're actually halted by the formation of a lobbying group, the Lead Industries Association in 1928. And as a result of that, lead was not completely banned in plumbing until the Safe Drinking Water Act of 1986. So we used lead in plumbing materials like solder and fittings for decades after the 1920s, but the use of lead pipe was pretty much discontinued by the 1920s. So primary sources of lead were really beginning to disappear, and it was kind of those secondary sources of lead that didn't disappear up until then. Um, we again, we'll talk some about some of the health hazards later, but if you guys have never seen this before, understand that there are still a lot of lead service mains out there in use that lead from the city water main in the street into the house itself. They can be identified by this bulb of lead solder where that service entrance comes into the home itself. So while we almost never see lead pipe in houses anymore, we do still see lead service entrances on a pretty regular basis. So older neighborhoods, Butler, Tarkington, uh, places like that, if you see a water main coming in like this and it has kind of this characteristic bulge in it, um, and it looks almost like a soft piping material, that is probably a lead water main coming into the house. Um, most of your buyers today, for pretty obvious reasons, are going to want to have that replaced when we find it. In a lot of instances, they've already replaced the main underground and they've left the lead service entrance actually at the house itself. So it's typically no more than four to six feet long anymore. So it's a pretty easy replacement in most cases. Every once in a while, we'll find one where it still runs all the way under the yard out to the street, which requires the replacement of the entire lead service main, which gets pretty pricey um, pretty quickly. So again, you will still see lead service mains in service or in use out there. Um, that's about the only lead piping we typically see in homes every morning all, or every um, day, every once in a great while, we will run across a little bit of lead pipe still in use in a house, but that's a pretty rare thing. A couple pictures of galvanized steel piping. We will talk more about the problems with it later on. There is still a ton of this in use in houses today, some of which was installed in the 1920s and it remained a popular plumbing material um, well into the 1950s and 1960s. A couple other plumbing materials we talked about, here's some pictures of them, cast iron drain pipe, ton of that stuff still in use out there, and still a lot of clay tile sewer drain in use out there as well. So a lot of these 1920s plumbing materials, very durable, lasted a long, long time, a lot of them are still in service. And again, we'll talk about some of the problems with that later. We don't want to get too deep into that now. Electrical needs in the 1930s. Remember, at least two thirds of our houses were wired for electricity in the 1920s. Um, but people's needs for electricity were really pretty basic at that point in time. Um, essentially what they used electricity for primarily was lighting. So a 30 amp fuse panel was actually the norm in a 1920s house. 
um, and they often featured nothing more than two plug fuses to protect two branch circuits, a knife blade switch to disconnect power to the panel, and thus the entire house. So your typical 1920s electrical panel was pretty darn simple and consisted of really two 15 amp circuits, and that was about it because they were primarily using it for lighting. Uh, those fuses were installed in a ceramic fuse holder, which was dead about it at a metal enclosure. And when you're in 1920s houses, you will still find a lot of these um, mounted on the wall, typically mostly abandoned every once in a while, actually still being used. Um, and actually, that's not all that uncommon as we talk about it. Um, to see these still in use for a couple of the original branch circuits in the house or repurposed as a junction box when they redid the wiring or updated the wiring in an original 1920s house. So you will still find a lot of these original disconnects in use in some way or another in a 1920s house. And they use this particular style of disconnect um, even for branch circuits or add-on circuits for decades after the 1920s. But originally, 1920s houses, two fuses, knife blade switch, and that was your electrical service to the house itself. 1920s, when we wired houses, we used knob and tube wiring, which you've, if you've dealt with older houses at all, is a term you're probably familiar with. It is the earliest form of electrical wiring, and we used it <coughs> until 1940 to 1950 here in central Indiana. Original knob and tube wiring from the 1920s persists to this day and consists basically of two wires, one hot wire and no, one neutral wire. There is no ground wire. Um, and that wiring is run on ceramic knobs and through ceramic tubes as it makes its way through the house and hence the term knob and tube wiring. So if you've never seen it before or only seen little bits of it, this is what it would have looked like in an original 1920s house. So every one of these pairs of wires is one circuit, so one hot and one neutral run on individual ceramic knobs through attics and void spaces in walls and through ceramic tubes where it would have penetrated through that framing. <clears throat> so it's knob and tube wiring. That's why it's called knob and tube wiring. There is still a ton of it in use out there. It is slowly going away but because it was used for so long as a wiring system, um, there is still a lot of it in use today. And we will talk a little bit later about some of the problems or disadvantages with knob and tube wiring. But electricity as we began or as we know it now was really starting to take hold by the 1920s. Uh, other 1920s building components, foundations of the 1920s were predominantly concrete or cinder block. That was far and away the most common foundation material for a 1920s house. We still use what's called cinder block today, although it's not really cinders anymore, uh, in a lot of applications. It's still used a lot in crawl space houses. It's still used a lot in commercial work. So that 19, well, 1900s to 1920s concrete block um, that so many people think of as being such an old building material, still in wide use today. Um, out in more rural areas of the country, we still used brick for some foundations. Uh, if block was not readily available, it was very expensive to transport because it's so heavy. We still used brick for some foundations and rubble stone or field stone foundations were still used occasionally in rural homes. If you had a family that had been plowing that farm field uh, for decades and gathering up those field stones that rise to the surface in the wintertime, they would still use those field stones for foundations even into the 1920s. But concrete block or cinder block, far and away the most common material for a 1920s foundation. It was quite a bit more decorative back then than what we think of today as cinder block because they made an attempt to make it actually look like dressed stone. So they would emboss it or put a pattern on it. So when you're driving through town and you see rows of houses with this kind of concrete block foundation, this probably dates it to, oh, no earlier, no later than about 1930. So this was the predominant style of concrete block in the 1920s. And it's what our original concrete block looked like. They were trying to make it look more like stone rather than the plain block that we typically see today. Concrete foundations actually were a thing in the 1920s. Um, concrete was really 
beginning to be used as a cast in place poured concrete foundation. Uh, in fact, if you know who Gustav Stickley is, uh, he was predominantly known for furniture design. So you've probably heard of Stickley furniture before, but he also designed houses and um, he would publish catalogs full of home design. And early as 1912, you can find versions of cast in place concrete foundations in his home catalogs. So we did have poured concrete foundations in the 1920s, but they were a feature predominantly of very expensive, very upper end houses, and it was not a commonplace material. Uh, interestingly, because we didn't have a lot of sheet material back then like plywood, they were formed with two-sided wooden forms, uh, which is why if you do find one dating from the 1920s or even into the 1930s or 40s, you'll oftentimes see the um, prints or that, that wood kind of embossed into the concrete because they were formed literally with boards and not with a sheet material like we would do now. Uh, in fact, some of his designs were so advanced for their time, um, you would actually add a third wooden form in the middle and form an air gap in your concrete foundation to help insulate that basement wall. So even as primitive as a lot of people think of the 1920s being, we were doing things back then that we don't do today because we consider them cost prohibitive, but um, things like adding an air gap and a foundation actually added a little bit of insulation to it and helped insulate that basement of that home because again, proportionally it cost more to heat that house in the winter time than it does now. So um, concrete forms or concrete casting was developed to the point where you could buy precast concrete foundations in the 1920s. And again, only for very expensive upper end houses, but they would truck those precast concrete foundations in and set them in place as the foundation for your house. So uh, people don't realize that, but we were doing poured concrete and cast concrete foundations in the 1920s. They still build industrial buildings this way today where they cast the walls um, laying flat on the ground and then truck them to the building and set them in place for a very durable, very energy efficient building. That technique was developed for basement walls in the 1920s. So again, um, a lot of what we think of as new, really modern ideas started in the 1920s. Framing of the 1920s, we'll try not to get too far into the weeds here, but the thing to keep in mind with 1920s houses um, is that we used wood for just about everything. By the 1920s, we were finally able to frame houses with uniform dimensional lumber cut at a sawmill. This was what was called true dimensional lumber. So a two by four then was actually two inches by four inches. A two by four today is about one and five eighths by about three and five eighths. So it's not actually two by four inches anymore, but mill spec lumber, back in the 1920s was true dimensional lumber. But that standardization meant you could now source that lumber from other parts of the country besides your local lumber yard and mill. So we could build all houses all across the country from uh, Western Red Cedar or Southern Yellow Pine because it was being brought here on rail cars. So it had to be dimensionally true so that no matter where we got it, it was all going to be the same size. We would set that structure on top of a masonry foundation, which we discussed and then everything else on top of that thing would be made out of wood. So we would have wood siding materials, wood trim, wood shingles, wood shakes uh, to finish the outside of that house. So wood was used all over the construction of that house, not just in the framing of it. Uh, and the way we framed houses through the 1920s was typically what was called balloon framing. Um, Balloon framing instead of platform framing, which was what we use now, requires the use of very long wall framing members, the studs of the house, um, because they run all the way from the very top of your foundation to the very top of your attic. So your exterior studs in your house, the, the exterior shell of the house was framed with one continuous piece of lumber from the top of the foundation all the way up to the peak of your roof to carry the entire weight of that house. And then you would essentially hang the floors of that house from that framing, um, which made for a very 
structurally solid, very well-framed, very durable house that was resistant to wind and the tornadoes that we have here, but required the use of very old growth timber to get those very long pieces of lumber to do that balloon framing. It also required that we fire block at the story levels of the house because framing this way creates a big void space that runs all the way from your basement to your attic. So if you get a fire in that wall, it can spread really quickly. Uh, we initiated that fire stopping in the 1920s and it essentially limited us to what we would consider regular two-story construction. So kind of plain Jane, simple houses um, because it was hard to come up with enough lumber to balloon frame a really complicated, really complex structure. So it didn't readily allow for newer housing styles that featured story offsets of floor overhangs or other irregularities in design and basically makes a lot of the houses of the turn of the century to the 1920s look something like this under the skin. So if you look closely at this picture, all these framing members run all the way from the top of our foundation all the way to the peak of our roof up here as one continuous piece of lumber. So that's why we have so many small bungalows leading up to the 1920s because of the cost of those larger pieces of lumber. By 1920, the builder, builders were beginning to switch over to what was considered a newer style or what was called Western platform framing at that point in time. And this is actually how we build a house today. So today we build a house almost like we build a layer cake. Each story of that house is independent from the one below it or the one on top of it. So we build a story, stop, we put a floor in, we build a story, stop, we put a floor in. Um, it was safer, faster, and cheaper to build houses this way because it meant that our lumber could use studs that were shorter, 8 to 12 feet long, instead of having to have studs that were 16, 20, 24 feet long from top to bottom. So this is what's called platform framing, and it's how we still build houses today. That had a couple of advantages to it. We didn't have to fire stop in between walls anymore because the platform has formed kind of a natural fire stop. It provides a safe and solid work platform as you're building the house. It has some downsides as well. Um, it's not nearly as wind resistant, wind resistant as a balloon framed house. So when you get a big windstorm or a tornado, um, it can literally lift those platforms or those sections of that house off. We actually have to bridge um, between those stories of house. Um, but it is the predominant method of framing houses that we still use today. And it has dominated the market since, honestly, about the mid-1900s, so 1940, 1950 or so. But it began to take hold in the 1920s. This is also when we begin to see the use of panel products like plywood um, for walls, floors, roof sheathing, things like that. But those were considered pretty advanced materials for the time and we still used uh, dimensional lumber boards for a lot of those applications as well. Um, and then we'll get into the, a little bit of the nitty gritty detail of framing here, but again, we'll try not to go too far. But keep in mind, headers for houses, because of the way we framed homes back then, uh, over windows and doors were almost non-existent. If we have a balloon frame that runs top to bottom for the entire house, we don't have to support a door nearly as much as we do if we have an entire platform or an entire second story resting on that area over a window. So when you think about things like headers over windows and doors in a 1920s house, they were often just a couple of two by fours, maybe one two by four laid horizontally to kind of bridge the gap over that door and the house didn't really sag because that entire wall was one continuous unit from the foundation up to the roof itself. In a modern house, because it's a platform, because that wall is not one continuous structure, we have to have these big heavy headers over those windows to carry the point load in that particular part of the house. So we began to see windows actually shrink in size in the 1920s because we have to have these headers over the top of them. So changing those construction methods to what was considered a more modern method of construction kind of changes the way windows worked and doors worked and the entire way we frame houses. So it affects everything from the top to bottom of the house. 
and gives us the shorter, smaller windows that we actually have today. Uh, other materials like roofing changed drastically in the 1920s. Uh, the popularity of asphalt roofing, so what we would consider a modern shingled roof, grew tremendously in the 1920s. Um, and that was because it was actually considered a more fire resistant roof. Uh, so the National Board of Fire Underwriters started a national campaign to eliminate the use of wood shingle roofs, which obviously burn pretty well in the event of a house fire with asphalt shingle roofing, which even though it's made of petroleum, was considered a much more fire resistant material in the 1920s because they would actually put asbestos fibers in those shingles to help retard the combustion of the asphalt used to bind them all together. So a lot of roofing materials, a lot of shingles of the 1920s were reinforced with asbestos to give them that fire resistance. But it's, we began when we, it's really when we began to see asphalt shingle roofs, what we would consider a, a modern roofing material or modern roof to look like, begin to appear in the 1920s as well. Um, customers liked them because you could get them in a huge variety of machine cut shingle shapes and sizes. Um, the ones we typically used here in the 1920s were what were called American method or straight shingles, so square or rectangular, but they came in all kinds of different shapes, sizes, styles, patterns. Uh, you could have straight laid, abutting adjacent, Dutch lap shingles, overlapping adjacent shingles. There's actually shingles that continued into the 1970s that you guys have probably seen that are a diamond shaped pattern that interlock that were great for wind resistance and storm resistance, but they required a more skilled craftsman to install. Um, but those were all made possible by the advent of that asphalt shingle that really began to take over in the 1920s. Um, even things like asbestos cement roofing which was considered a very modern material for the time and persisted into the 1980s, believe it or not, first made their appearance in the 1920s. So basically a cement roof reinforced with asbestos fibers is a modern miracle product of the 1920s. Very fire resistant because it's asbestos and cement, very heavy, but also very durable. Uh, and as a building material was around into the mid to early 1980s. Um, we've actually had houses on Geist here locally that have asbestos cement roofs on them that date to the time they were built in 1983, 1984, 1985, um, that are finally about coming due for replacement, um, which obviously cost a pretty penny because it's got asbestos in it, but very durable material originally developed in the 1920s. Even asbestos cement siding, um, was a material from the 1920s. So this is basically um, what was originally developed as roofing material adapted for use actually as a siding material. And you guys have probably seen this if you're used to dealing with older homes, older homes downtown. Essentially looks, um, it was typically embossed with a brick pattern to make it appear more like a brick. Um, and it actually came in two flavors, asbestos cement, which was a more rigid material, and then there was actually an asbestos asphalt material that looked like a roofing shingle embossed with a kind of a brick pattern on it as well. And it was used to cover entire houses as a siding in the 1920s. Again, fire resistant, pretty darn durable material, pretty water resistant. The downside, of course, for today's buyer is it has asbestos in it, which is now considered an environmental hazard. But it was one of those materials that was introduced in the 1920s as well. So just an absolute ton of new building materials coming out in the 1920s, uh, some of which persist to this day or variations of them persist to this day. Some of them lasted for decades after the 1920s. One of the more fascinating things that were trendy in the 1920s is actually kit houses, or as you'll hear them commonly referred to Sears houses. Um, Although there were a ton of different manufacturers that sold them out there, Sears was just one of the more well-known ones. But actually kit houses um, were pre-manufactured or pre-cut houses um, that were sold in a really, believe it or not, a ton of different plans and styles. And they ranged from very simple bungalows to very imposing colonial houses, plantation style houses. Um, 
So they're not just the normal small little cottages or bungalows people typically think of them as being. But basically, it was an entire house supplied at a fixed price with all the materials needed for construction of a particular floor plan of home that typically excluded the brick, the concrete, and the masonry because those were very heavy and very expensive to ship. So the buyer would get everything essentially from the ground up on the house and then arrange to have the foundation done locally. And your entire house would arrive on a series of trucks or a rail car and be carted to the job site and then would be put together basically as a do-it-yourself kit if you wanted to, or you could have a local contractor do it. A lot of people think, again, really simple bungalows because what else could you possibly ship to a, a job site? But they ranged in size and style from a relatively simple bungalow to, again, these kind of Georgian plantation style, really fancy houses. These are actually kit houses, believe it or not. Um, there is, it's a reproduction of one, but if you ever go up to Prophetstown State Park in West Lafayette, there is a um, reproduction Sears kit farmhouse up there that actually is really well done. So even farmhouses of that period could be purchased as a kit house and then put together on site. So kit houses were definitely a thing of the 1920s. Um, it's always useful <coughs> to talk about building codes of the 1920s or at least touch on them because a lot of our buyers today truly don't realize that standardized building codes are a relatively modern invention. And that if you are dealing with an older house, um, a century house, like a 1920s home, most of them were actually built without the benefit of a standardized building code. So our clients today always worry about something being up to code and they don't realize that a, an old house really was built without much, if any, standardized building code whatsoever. And that is because a lot of the standardization in home building can actually be attributed to the FHA, which is not the FHA of today, but um, the FHA of today is actually the current department, it's, it's HUD, it's the Department of Housing and Urban Development. It's not the FHA today, which is basically a loan body. Um, but they did not begin to put to the forth um, minimum property requirements or building codes until after World War II and the building boom we saw then. So up until that post-World War II boom in the 1940s, most early 20th century building codes were local, and they really, if they existed, only pertained to the structure, the foundation, and the framing of the house. They were typically based on rules of thumb, not on any particular scientific evidence or calculations. Um, and they typically, again, only specified structural stuff. They really began to be developed or standardized across the country in the 1920s by the Department of Commerce. Um, but it was not until that point in time that they started to use things like span tables and footing sizes and other construction specifications to standardize those building codes. So again, any building codes that existed in the 1920s were more or less locally applied rules of thumb. So they you know, had to take into account things like stone foundations, soil support for those foundations, things of that nature. But the takeaway here is that those building codes were very arbitrary and designed in a lot of instances um, to rely heavily on the experience and judgment of the designer and builder of that house. So such a thing as a 1920s building code is very primitive compared to what we consider a building code today. And where this is really important for us in this industry is that as building codes developed and evolved over the years and decades following the turn of the century into the 1920s, anything built prior to that point in time was grandfathered into that code. So just because it's something that we would consider unacceptable today doesn't mean it was unacceptable back then. And it's very difficult to ask a seller to remedy something that was considered acceptable when the house was built. Now, there are exceptions to that, like knob and tube wiring and some environmental hazards. But by and large, what we typically see in this industry called out all the time 
as a building code violation is something that has existed in that house since the time it was built and isn't something that can typically be asked to be rectified during the inspection process. And so, so many of our buyers today don't understand that at all. They think that it's, if it's out of spec with today's modern building code, there must be something wrong with it. Um, and it's, it's something we have to explain constantly that building codes have evolved from a very primitive form um, that's happened over a long period of time. And generally building code, you know, quote unquote violations that we would see today were probably completely compliant when they were built. You're not typically required to bring something up to code until you do a major renovation or a major retrofit of that product or system in a house. So, you know, bringing plumbing up to code doesn't typically have to be done until you tear out all the plumbing and start new again. Bringing wiring up to code doesn't typically have to be done until you tear out all the wiring during a major renovation and completely redo that wiring. Even something as dumb as a GFCI was not required in the building industry until roughly 1980 or so. So all those houses out there, and you guys have all seen those inspection reports that say there's no GFCI protection in the bathrooms or the kitchen. That really wasn't even a required thing until about 1980 for those areas, 1990 really in kitchens. Um, and so many things that we deal with in the real estate and in the inspection industry are modern day code requirements that just didn't exist until relatively recent times. So that's why we put the building code section in here is to give you guys some idea that there really wasn't a lot of building code in the 1920s, 30s. Um, and what there was was pretty localized and based, generally speaking, on rules of thumb. So when you're dealing with an older 1920s house, there are going to be a lot of things in it that don't meet modern building code. Those are not necessarily deficiencies or defects in the house. They just are part of that house and part of the history of that house. Okay, a little bit more fun information, some very common 1920s home styles because we're in the real estate industry and we like to look at houses. And Matt, just heads up, you've got 10 minutes. We've got 10, oh my God, I've been talking that long? Yes. Okay, I don't even know how many slides we have left, but let's look at some fun stuff here and talk real briefly about it. Um, smaller colonial style houses, really common in the 1920s. Dutch colonials, a little bit bigger style house with a very typical or very correct characteristic gambrel shaped roof on them. Very common 1920s houses. We see these kind of all over the city. Uh, craftsman style houses, which is my personal favorite, but I won't bore you guys with that because we only have 10 minutes here to go. Um, very common in the 1920s. There are pockets of these all over the city, most notably to me because we're relatively close to them, just east of um, the state fairgrounds, right down along 38th Street here. There's large pockets of beautiful old craftsman houses. Um, Tudors, very common. I can picture a lot of these in Butler Tarkington, right along Meridian Street. Um, lots of 1920s Tudor houses here in the city. American Foursquare, which is my all-time favorite style of house. Again, lots of these, uh, kind of that east of the fairgrounds, 38th Street neighborhood and scattered in other neighborhoods all throughout the city. Actually, Fortville out here where Liz lives and adjacent to me in McCordsville, there's a lot of American Foursquares built in the 1920s. Really cool floor plan if you've never seen one before. All kinds of different bungalows built all over the city in the 1920s. Relatively small, relatively simple, relatively easy to build. So you'll see a lot of those out there. Prairie style houses, which a lot of people associate with a little bit later in timeline, actually were considered a craftsman uh, style house or an arts and crafts style house. Um, arts and crafts, craftsman, prairie are all very closely related, but even some of these kind of low slung prairie style houses, which a lot of people associate with later 1950s style houses, first began to appear in the 1920s. So you will find these scattered around the city as well. Um, but these are all different, very different styles of houses. All have their genesis or their popularity in the 1920s. Real quickly, some concerns for today's buyer with modern 1920s houses. 
Knob and tube is one of those rare things that in the inspection business is now considered a major hazard no matter where we find it. The wire is old, the insulation is dry and brittle. That wiring was never meant to be run under insulation, so it has a tendency to overheat and catch fire. It requires very specific splicing procedures. There's no ground wire, <coughs> which is not a bigger problem as people might think. But the biggest problem with knob and tube wiring now is it's becoming very difficult or impossible to insure. So knob and tube wiring, popular in the 1920s, actually all the way through the 1940s, is one of those things where when we find active knob and tube wiring now is one of those automatic majors. And it's one of those rare things that's an automatic major because of the fire hazard and the insurance problems associated with it. Plumbing materials in the 1920s that are problematic for today's buyer. Remember all those materials we talked about? Galvanized steel pipe, cast iron pipe, clay pipe. They are all technically well past their expected lifespan and can present significant problems such as leaks, reduced water pressure, clogged or collapsed drains. But on the other hand, a lot of those materials were really, really durable and they may still be in good shape and working just fine. So a lot depends on what we find on an individual basis in a 1920s house. Um, in this case, it's not like knob and tube wiring. And if that plumbing material is doing what it's supposed to be doing, if our water pressure is good, if it's not leaking, if we do a sewer scope on that house and we find the drain tile hasn't collapsed, there's really nothing wrong with those materials. And in this case, it's one of those areas where just because it's old, it doesn't mean it's defective. Keep in mind in a 1920s house in things like galvanized steel, it can rust out, it can clog. We're always going to be looking for leaks and reduced water pressure. But if we don't find that, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with the material. Um, same thing with cast iron. It can clog up, it can leak. But if it's not doing either of those things, it's fine. Clay tile, if it collapses, um, obviously it's problematic. So if we see problems with that in a sewer scope, Again, plumbing materials, generally speaking, just because it's old doesn't mean it's defective. If we find lead of any kind, again, that is one of those rare automatic major items in an inspection report because we're all well aware of the problems associated with lead piping. We've looked at that service entrance already, so if we find any lead, that's going to go as an automatic major item into an inspection report. Um, quick note here, keep in mind clay service tiles or clay drain tiles were used into the 1980s in a lot of neighborhoods. So people always ask us what's a good cutoff for a sewer scope on a house. 1980 is about the oldest you want to go and not get a sewer scope on a house uh, because it was actually used as a drain material up until that point in time. I'll give you, I can give you guys a whole big long dissertation on lead paint in the lead presentation that we have. Uh, rule of thumb here, if you're looking at a house built in the 1920s, assume it's gonna have some lead paint somewhere in it. Typical foundation problems that we see in 1920s houses revolve around the fat or revolve around moisture intrusion. The big takeaway here is that when we design houses in the 1920s, we expected some dampness and some water intrusion in the basement of that house. Those basements were not meant to be livable spaces. The disconnect here is that today's buyers expect that all basements can be converted to livable spaces. And in most cases, a 1920s basement without a lot of work cannot be converted to a livable space. Because when you get enough rain and the soil gets saturated, you are going to get a little bit of moisture intrusion in a 1920s basement. It was not considered a big deal and it is just the way we designed foundations back then. They were meant to tolerate a little bit of water or moisture intrusion. Some of the problems we see that revolve around 1920s HVAC systems, buried oil tanks were a thing in 1920s houses. Uh, those are really not as big an environmental problem as most people think, but conversely, most of today's buyers want them removed. So if we find one, they typically want it dug up and done away with. Uh, we used a lot of asbestos in building materials in 1920s houses, so there's always a potential to have asbestos in a house itself. And then in some 1920s houses, it can actually be very difficult to put in central air conditioning because they weren't designed for the ductwork that we need for central air conditioning. We've already talked about building codes, so we can kind of skip over that one. 
Let me show you guys a couple pictures of historically listed 1920s houses, and I think then we're almost done. But the Burton House in 1920 is a historically listed 1920s house that incorporates a lot of the design elements of the time, including kind of the Spanish mission influence, which wasn't real popular here, but you will see it occasionally with the clay tile roof. Uh, the Devonshire Apartments, apartment living in the 1920s, because again, remember that mortgage slide, people rented a lot more then than they did now. Um, apartments back then were just really, really cool. Um, whole different era, whole different topic for that time, but apartment living in the 1920s, very much different than what we would consider it today. Uh, I should have bought this house when I had a chance, although it was very popular when it went up for sale. This is right around the corner from Liz in Fortville and right around the corner from me here in McCordsville. But there is a very large, very fancy Indiana limestone and block 1920s house in Fortville if you ever want to take a look at it. Some of the bigger structures around us built in the 1920s, Hinkle Field House, 1927. More importantly, ross Aid Stadium. Uh, 1924, both of those obviously still in use to this day. Those were built in the 1920s. And then most importantly of all, Triple X up in West Lafayette actually built in the 1920s as well. So I consider these last two, Ross Aid and Triple X, to be the most historically significant 1920s structures in the state of Indiana. I know some of you are just dying right now. <laughs> Uh, okay. Oh, and there's some Purdue fans too. Um, Matt, you managed to wrap it up with two minutes to go. So, I mean, does anyone have any quick questions? Or Rosie, do you have anything to say? Oh my God, the only thing I have to say was that was phenomenal. That was so fun. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's nerding out over history. So I'm glad that you guys enjoyed it. We're working on having houses by the period. So like uh, 1800s houses, 1940s houses, just looking at the history and the times and the things that uh, impact buyers and, um, and construction. So we're excited about that. But um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to say. Matt? I, if you guys like this, if it was actually interesting, please let us know because so much of what we have to teach as CE and so much of what you guys get in CE is so mind-numbingly boring, in my oh-so-humble opinion, that when we do stuff like this, we try and bring a little bit of the history to it and try and make it at least a little bit interesting. So putting these together is actually kind of fun and teaching them is kind of fun because so many people don't understand the history of the times and the houses that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. We get so bogged down in the complaints and the modern problems with them, we don't appreciate them for what they actually are, so. Yeah, I don't know if you guys have seen uh, the comments pouring in on the chat, but this was like incredibly interesting and we agree that CE is typically mind-numbing, so this is uh, yeah. fantastic. Good. And if there's any particular time frames of houses you guys would like to know more about, let Liz know. But I know we have at least 1800s houses and 1940s houses in the works. And then we'll probably... And Jenny, there's, uh, see, there's enough happening in the 50s, have... 60s, and 70s going on that we may split those out as well. Because there's so many new materials and techniques at those points in time that they get fascinating too. Okay, Matt. I'm gonna, Jenny, uh, we do have this as a CE class. I will work um, with Rosie for the people who are in this class. We can actually give you CE credit, even though it didn't take the full two hours. I feel like we just went through enough information. So I will send um, a link for Rosie. Rosie, can you send it out to the people who are attending? And we'll make sure that we give you guys CE credit for today. That's great. Thanks, Liz. And yeah, well, let's get together and brainstorm about more CE for our group because Sounds fantastic. Awesome. So, okay. Well, thank you Matt guys. And I will jump off, but if you guys have any questions, reach out and we'll be happy to answer them. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thanks, guys. Bye.